Thank you, brother. Amen. God bless you. Give me a look. Thank you. I have an appreciation for all kinds of Christian music. When I was first saved, there was nothing but hymns and Southern Gospel. When I was a child, there was nothing but hymns. And the biggest controversy in the church when I was a young Christian was Southern Gospel. Uh -huh. You could go to certain churches and they wouldn't let you bring the drums in. Come on. I mean, I'm serious. I mean, Baptist church. Uh, come on, right? You know to play the drums on this things you can believe in. I've seen the greatest controversy in church. And then when contemporary music came along, yeah, because of the era I grew up in, and I feel like ancient. And uh, as far as I know, in this county at least, I was uh, the first pastor and certainly the first evangelist that brought <coughs> contemporary music into this area, you know. It took them about 20 years to catch up. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, we fought for 20 years trying to say it's okay, it's okay. David didn't have a grand piano on his back, and he didn't have a banjo. Amen. Come on. You know, come on. They had harps and trumpets and drums and cymbals. And it's not exactly what you put together in Southern Gospel, you know what I'm saying? That's right. Come on. <laughs> I've done some... some Contemporary and Southern Gospel CDs in life, and they're not exactly, when you go into a studio, what you want to put together is, you know, the Southern Gospel is trumpets and flutes and not exactly what you want to do. And so, uh, it's changing for me. Right. And it's changing full scale. Now, God never changes, His Word never changes, but we change. Because we, as the church, have been conformed to the image of Christ. Nothing wrong with Southern Gospel. Some of the most beautiful music in the world sings. Amen. Amen. You know, I don't know how to improve on some hymns. Amen. Bring forth the royal God. That's right. Crown him, Lord. How do you get it? on that. Amen. I don't know how you do better than that. Come on. But we've got to accept change. When you get to heaven, do you think you're going to just lie away and sing on you? I would change. Amen. It's not a matter of my taste. It's not a matter of my likes. It's a matter of what God's doing. And we're, we're coming full circle back around. Not to the law, but in worship. In church today, it was found when I was going to church, you danced in church. I don't know if you got out of town without calling you back. <laughs> and today I see it in church. And I don't mean rock and roll. I mean, I'm talking about beautiful dancing and it's worship. Amen. And it all started in Jerusalem a long time ago. And if you go there today during the feast, you still see it. It's their tradition and they never... Let it go. And if you would go there this morning, you'd feel at home. When you get home, you always feel at home. Amen. During the millennial reign, that's where we're going to reign from. Jesus is going to be on the throne of David in Jerusalem. There's a sense that it's home. Because we need the Jew or Gentile, but we're all the seed of Abraham, all of us who are the seed of faith in Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look with me if you would to 2 Samuel. Chapter 18, I'm going to pick up a couple, three or four verses there, and then we're going over to chapter 19 for a couple of verses. Verse 24, chapter 18. And David sat between two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof, opened the gates on the wall, and lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man ran along. And you got to understand, before cell phones and telephones and the internet, especially soldiers and kings, they had a way of doing things where they could detect certain signals and signs and way of doing things that, they, that brought their messages within itself. And the watchman cried and told the king, and the king said, if he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. And he came 
to the place and drew near. Now I'm going to help you there. If he be alone, when he saw the single runner, he knew it was good news. Amen. And the watchman saw another runner. And to the king, that would be a sign of bad news. And the watchman called, cried out, yelled, whatever word you would like to use to define the, the phrase, the watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man runneth along. And the king said, He also brings tidings. Verse 33. And the king was much moved. This was at the tidings. The king was much moved and went up into his chambers, chamber over the gates. You got to understand, there was a fortress that were walls, thick walls, Amen. that were constructed around Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, to keep the enemy out. And upon these walls, they'd have a watchman, a lookout, Amen. security guard. And he would look out over the landscape to see if there were any enemies. Joab was in a battle with one of the sons of David because he had decided to overthrow his father's throne. His name was Absalom. And he knows that they're proceeding after Absalom, and David hopes that they capture Absalom and bring and Joab, his chief general, brings. Absalom to him. He hopes Absalom surrenders with the armies when the armies of David and of Israel comes. David has a problem. His son has been campaigning in the streets against him and the scripture said he had, David said he has turned the hearts of the men of Israel to him. He's campaigning. He's running against his father. And there's a reason. There's a reason. When the king had more than one wife, you understand there, there were situations where there were half-sisters and half-brothers and <coughs> one of absent had a sister that had the same mom and dad that he had. They could be in the dad of on her. She's a half-sister to some of the other children of David, and one of David's sons of Rachel's absent sister. Absent in his desire to protect and avenge his sister kills his brother. David's so angry at it, he puts Absalom out of his sight. For two years. Absalom wants to come and see his father, talk to his father, reunite with his father, but David's angry and says no. And what David actually does, he drives Absalom into rebellion. Not meaning to, but by showing no mercy. He learned some things about mercy. I understand his pain, his suffering, his anger. I understand Absalom's desire to protect his sister and avenge her, and it's a mess. And the soldiers of Israel or of Jerusalem are trying to find Absalom and find him they do. Absalom had long, beautiful, golden hair. Now you who think all Jews are have brown hair, but again, he has long golden hair. He has hair like his dad. When you read, there's a description of David in the Bible when he's a young man, he has golden hair, he has blonde hair. He's really nice looking guy. Now, since 
a really nice looking guy and he has this long golden hair in it in, in the Bible. You know, that's his, his pride, his glory. It's supposed to be a woman's glory, but absent use it his law. Oh, boy, that, that king would be short. So like a bangles, you know, he's short. <laughs> and his hair gets caught on the limb in a tree. And he's hung between heaven and earth by his hair. Now, when I was a young Christian, they told you that was a good reason to get your hair cut. <laughs> the night I got saved, I had an earring in this ear, left ear. No right ears. The guys had no right ears there. Sideways. No, no, no. Had it in my left ear. I had, my, I had long hair. And the first thing the Baptist church started doing was working on me about that hair. And it took them a while to get talked me and get it cut. And after I got it cut, years later, after I passed the 30s, I thought, why did I get my hair cut? What is long according to the Bible? I never know. Absent would be a picture of long gun. I, mean, I know it was long, but the Bible said it was. Yeah. I know a woman wasn't to cut her hair because it was her glory. That's right. That didn't mean you couldn't trim the ends, you know. I mean, people you go crazy, you know, yeah. sometimes. But I'm saying they didn't shave their heads. Yeah. Men sometimes shave, but I see men that still shave. Some of us old hippies that were hippies before God saved us, you know, we cut our hair and now we've lost it, you know. We'd be like, why did I cut my hair? I wish I had my hair back. I don't have any hair. Yeah. And Joab, David's general, has absolutely killed David's son. And a messenger comes to tell David they have found Absalom. But at the time he runs, Absalom's not dead. David saw that and said, it's a good sign. They found Absalom. Even before he gets there to tell it, he knows the message. I mean, he, he's, he knows, he's king. He, he understands this stuff. It's good news when there's one run. But then, Watchman cries out to the porter and says, there's a second runner. Oh, Lord. That's like when your son or your husband or your daughter's in the military and you see military guys knocking on the door. It's not the good news. Amen. They don't send them when it's good news. Right. David knows it looks bad. And when the second runner arrives, he gives the word, absence dead. <coughs> David does what any father would do. He grieves, verse 33. And the king was much moved, that means emotional, <coughs> and went up into the chambers over the gates and wept. And as he wept, thus he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. For the people had heard the saying that day how the king was grieved for his son. That's a natural response. David can't help his emotions. He understands. When Joab gets there, Joab says to David, what are you doing? You've shamed them. All of Israel. And this is why he says that Absalom is your son, but Absalom became your enemy. And not only was he your enemy, he was the enemy of Israel once he turned against the king. He is guilty of treason and an effort to overthrow the kingdom, the government. And God gives us the victory. We destroy Absalom, 
and you shame us instead of saying God has given us the victory, you have shamed us. David understands and he rises and he washes himself and takes a shower or bath or whatever he did and he claims up. He's still mourning inside, but he doesn't display it outside any longer because he doesn't want Israel to mourn the victory that God has given him. Amen. Now, the title of my message this morning, and I'll try to be brief because I've already been in a good ways, is a dad that killed his son. Because at least to some degree of the word, that's what happened. When David drew, drove Absalom from his presence, he drove him into rebellion. It's not that he intended for him to rebel and try to overtake the throne. He was punishing him, but he went about it the wrong way. And what the result of that is, Absalom became rebellious. Because the man who's supposed to love him the most 